Now I get the honor mm. of having a conversation with you. Um, and I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. That was the hard part right yeah. there. Mm. Um, the, uh, having, having read your book, uh, I have a lot, a lot of questions to ask. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like uh, before that, I want to give, by way of background, uh, Indra was on the list while she was, the 12 years she was in charge of Pepsi, it was on the list of the most ethical companies. And you had, and not only did you uh, outpace the S&P 500, you did it with a purpose, uh, and you did it with compassion. Um, and under your watch, uh, your performance with a purpose um, around nourishing people, replenishing the environment, um, and cherishing your own people uh, was, uh, was a hallmark, along with the makeover of the Pepsi product line around good for you and better for you. Mm -hmm. But I want to start where President Bush uh, ended, and that was around an immigrant. Uh, your story. You're the first immigrant to lead a Fortune 50 company. And in your book, you talk about being a guest in someone else's house. Did that motivate you? And when did that change along your journey to where you felt at home? First of all, thank you for having me. Mr. President, thank you so much for considering me for this honor. I'm really privileged. I'm emotional, actually. I'm going to try not to cry. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think back to my growing up in Madras in India. And I was born seven years after India got independence in a very conservative family. Never dreamed I would do anything but get arranged marriage, married away to somebody. Um, you know, get educated, yeah, but some guy's waiting there. My parents are going to pick him, and that's what life is going to be. And then I won the lottery of life. Uh, my father and my grandfather, the men in my family said, our girls are going to study and do whatever they want to do. So they gave us the ability to spread our wings and fly, to become an engineer or a doctor, not a business person. But then my sister got into business school in India, and she set the stage for me to go to business school, because if I hadn't gotten into business school myself, I would have been viewed as a failed sister, because that's how we were compared all the time. So I went to business school in India, and then one thing led to another, and everybody told me that if you want to really um, understand what the world is like, you have to go to the United States. It's the seat of entrepreneurship, innovation, culture. This is where ideas flow, and you can be a different person if you go to the United States. So I applied to the Yale School of Management, which was a brand new school. And my parents said, of course, we can't afford it. Therefore, you will not go. I got in. And then they said, we can't afford to send you, so don't even think about it. Then I got a letter from Yale saying, we'll give you loans and a work program. You have to work and earn your keep. I went to my parents and said, can I go? And surprisingly, they bought me a ticket, which is, again, winning the lottery of life. So I came to the United States as an immigrant in 1978. And to put it in context, it was at a time when suitcases didn't have wheels. That's the best, that's the best way to talk about it, OK? Because I still remember carrying these two suitcases six inches at a time from the international office to my dorm. And then started this unbelievable love affair with the United States. Remember, I came into this country as a legal immigrant with a visa through the front door into a wonderful university. Uh, not much of a support structure, but that's how I came in. And what happened since then, um, how I got promoted, mentored through, was something that I'd never experienced any place else. So I feel a deep sense of gratitude about what this country has done for me. And in many ways, can I say, only in America could somebody like me have come in as an immigrant and ascended to lead a Fortune 50 company. So I am a product of the United States. So. Now, you know, as a woman also, um, you've been pioneered in so many stages in your life. You're one of a handful of women to, to fill in the blank. Mm. You, you described yourself as a tomboy growing up. <laughs> um, you started a girl band called The Logarithms. Hey, that's a cool name. Please. Cool name. <laughs> kind of nerdy, but good. I like that. But you also started a women's cricket team in mm -hmm. high school as well as college debate. At, at each time, you were not intimidated. Um, where did that come from? I don't know. I think it's because, you know, second 
ch middle children have a problem because nobody gives us attention. So you have to do something to get attention. My sister was brilliant, my younger brother was brilliant, and I'm caught in the middle. So academics, I'm not gonna distinguish myself because they're much too smart, the, my brother and my sister. So I decided I was gonna do extracurricular activities and show them that I could be somebody. So I did everything that a manageable young girl shouldn't be doing, climbing trees, playing cricket, playing in a rock band, and I was sure that would disqualify me from the marriage market. It didn't, <laughs> <laughs> but that was my goal in life. But what is surprising is my parents allowed me to do this, they showed up for my concerts when I was playing in uh, the rock band. We were terrible, but they showed up. Um, when I played the cricket match, my family would show up. So it's surprising that they actually came in and encouraged me. But the most interesting one was, I remember when my sister was going away to business school and for the first time leaving home, and she told my mother, I'm going away. And my mom said, you cannot leave until you get married because if you left home as a single woman, nobody will marry you. And my sister said, I'm not getting married now, I'm going to business school. My mom said, I'm going to fast till I die. <laughs> and so the two of us kids, terrified, and went to the grandfather and the father, and they said, you know what, let her die. <laughs> okay, we'll take care of you. Don't worry about it, we'll take care of you. And you know what, gave us a lot of confidence. 24 hours later, mom broke the fast. <laughs> Grandfather's dead, father's dead, mom's still alive. <laughs> so I love this letter die, it's okay. <laughs> well, and, and that brings me to your family. Your, your family is obviously very important, in, very important to you. Um, and both your, your grandfather and your father had a big Im, Im, impact. And as your career progressed, your mother came here and lived with you and your kids to help you in that support system. Um, did your fa describe how your family fits into your, your leadership style. I don't even know what life is without the family because growing up, you know, we had freedom within a very tight frame and the frame was open only if we earned our grades and behaved properly and if you did anything that was out of the rule box, that box became smaller. So we grew up in a very, very, uh, very conservative, very protected environment, that's the way I'd put it. But I think that having a foot on the brake and a foot on the accelerator at home made all the difference because we knew what limits we had and how to function within those limits, which is a very good thing. And the president talked about education. Oh my God, the focus on education was punishing. Uh, if you got 98 in geography, that was a crisis at home. What happened to the other two marks, you know? It was just, it was constantly, you were never good enough. Uh, and if you came and said, but grandpa, that was the best grade in the class, he'll say, in a class of dunces, you got 98. <laughs> so it was like, nobody ever said to you, good job. I don't believe in my entire life, my family members have said, good job, or I love you, or given me a hug. Never, nobody. Okay, the first time it happened was when I got married. Where's my husband? He's right there. So, you know, they don't do those things. So we never got positive reinforcement. And so the family was good, but in the American context where I tell my kids I love you 15 times a day, we were bereft in many ways, okay? But we did fine. Coming here, um, having kids, I don't know how you can do it without family support. Uh, nannies are not enough, you need family support. I keep telling our kids, get married and have children, give them to me, I'll give them back to you when either we pass or the kids are ready to go to college. <laughs> so if you don't give that sort of a support, I don't know how these young people today can have kids, keep a job, somehow do all the things they have to do. It's not possible, Ken, because the biological clock and the career clock are in conflict with each other. Unless you build a support structure around you, it just doesn't work. Okay, so your mother, um, you mentioned keep one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake. Um, so your, your mother guided you along the way and at the same time culturally to balance the role of a woman in the house, in the household, along with um, being prideful of your professional accomplishments. Um, how, did that, uh, how did that pull, uh, that sort of tug of war, uh, play out in, as, you, as your career progressed? <laughs> there was never a time where I could come home and everybody fawn over me and bring me my chapels and my uh, drink. That never happened. <laughs> okay, so you come home, you just have to make a quick uh, change and become the mother, the wife, 
the everything in the house. And so um, my mother would say, leave the crown in the garage. Don't walk in with your crown, because when you walk in the house, you're a wife and a mother and a daughter, and you have those roles to play. Um, they never say that to the guys, but they always say that to the women. And so, you know, what, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to change her. Uh, so, uh, you know, I learned how to leave my crown in the garage. Not that there was a crown, but I learned to leave whatever it was in the garage. And that was the story where you had just been promoted yeah. to president of Pepsi, and you drove home, and they said, go to the store and get some milk. That's right. And, and, and she's always put me down that way. Not put me down. Look, that's reality of life. <laughs> You know, somebody has to do the work, and there's no point trying to say, hey, I'm president, I won't do these things. Okay, it doesn't work. Somebody has got to do the, sh the work. <laughs> the work, the work. <laughs> somebody has got to do the work. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. President. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> Now, one of your early experiences professionally was at BCG, Boston Consulting Group, mm. and their, um, their, leave pol their family leave policy was very generous and allowed you to go home uh, to be with your father. Um, you know, BCG didn't have a leave policy, and so I was a young consultant, and a year after I started, my father has pancreatic cancer, has six months to live at the most, and, you know, uh, Raj has just graduated from business school in the University of Chicago. Uh, you know, I'm a young consultant. We don't have money. Uh, pretty dead broke. And um, if my father is sick and I have to take off six months to be with him because I intended to be with him and see him through his death, my sister and I are sitting here figuring out what to do. Then BCG calls me and says, we hear that your father is dying. Uh, we've decided to give you six months off with pay. Never heard of this. They've never done this for anybody. They didn't have a sick leave, paid leave policy. They just put it in. And uh, my father died in three months. Three months, one day I was back at work. So I never exploited that uh, time off. But the fact that BCG was so generous in giving me that time off allowed me to spend the last days with my father. And I'll never forget the firm for their incredible generosity. And when you got to Pepsi, that was a priority for you to make sure that most certainly the leave policies and and the from child care to elder care we had to make sure that people felt like they came to work at pepsico and didn't have to leave themselves at the door because they're all parents or sisters or uh, aunts and uncles and citizens of the citizens of the community so we wanted to make sure people could balance both uh, without compromising on productivity and whatever we had to do in the company and so we put in the appropriate policies, the time off, uh, you know, being sensitive to all of these that need, needed to be done. And I think that made for a better company, a better workforce, higher retention, more leaders. I mean, just to give you an idea, we have, just on my, my watch, we have 11 CEOs of US companies today who were under my watch at PepsiCo, 11 CEOs. We have six, yeah, so we, you know, people stuck around. We have 16 CEOs today who were around PepsiCo in my time who are doing brilliantly today in America. And so I look at this and go, if you create the right environment in the company, balancing all these needs, you actually develop better leaders, better managers, and you retain them longer. And there's great loyalty that they have to, towards the company. In, in fact, you said Pepsi was a talent academy that sold drinks and snacks. In a way, yes. In a way, yes. It still is a talent academy. And I mean, look, it started with the leaders before me, and I just made it better and better because I felt that was my single biggest responsibility, to develop more successes than the company could ever handle. And you know, people like, is Ray Hunt here? No. Ray Hunt was on our board. Uh, you know, uh, when time came for me to transition out of PepsiCo, they had five people to pick from, five successors. That's how it should be a succession. Right. And it felt great that the board had so many choices. Isn't every company a talent academy? Shouldn't every leader look at their, look at their company and say we're a talent academy that puts out a product? I think so, but I, the question I would ask is why don't boards hold CEOs accountable for being talent academies? Mm -hmm. Because developing talent is a very unselfish thing. Because if you develop a great leader, and if they're ready to ascend to the top, then you have to get out. 
right? Many leaders don't want to get out. So they hold people back and say, when I'm ready to leave, maybe I'll showcase this person. My point is, hey, I'm going to develop all of you. The day you are ready for the job, I'm out of here. Because you've got to worry about the company and its future, not your longevity in the company. So if you manage the company for the company and not for you, you'll have a very different unselfish perspective about the company. OK. So when you advise young women mm. um, about balancing their uh, work life and their, and their personal life, um, how, do you, uh, how do you guide them? You want the truth? I tell them there is nothing called balance. It doesn't exist. At best, you can juggle all these priorities. How can you do six jobs at the same time? You know, being a mother is two or three jobs. Being an executive, just an executive, forget CEO, is a few more jobs. On top of that, if you want to be in the community, if you want to do something for yourself, that's another couple of jobs. You cannot do these six jobs and be sane at the same time, because they expect you to be sane, right? And women already are super people, OK, because they somehow make it all work. But anybody who uses the word balance is, is, is crazy. I think at best you can juggle these priorities and hope that the most important ones don't fall to the floor. But it's a juggling act every day. I mean, I'll give you one story, Ken. Um, when my children were to come to the Sacred Heart in Greenwich, and I get a call from my younger daughter, Mom, your turn to bring chocolate chip cookies for the class coffee this morning. I go, you didn't tell me. I didn't do it. She said, it's on the uh, you know, little uh, table on the refrigerator. You didn't see it. Yes, I didn't see it. I was busy. So now it's like 9 o'clock. I'm supposed to walk in with chocolate chip cookies at 10 o'clock. And she says, do not bake those Nestle Toll House cookies. Because <laughs> everybody knows that you're supposed to make homemade cookies. <laughs> Where am I going to make homemade cookies? First, I don't know how to make them, and I can't do it in an hour. So I called onto my cafeteria and said, guys, I need help. I need homemade cookies in an hour. In 40 minutes, I'll pay whatever it takes. Just give it to me. So I go, on it, Mrs. Nui. So in 40 minutes, I get the most delectable uh, homemade cookies in aluminum foil, so it's not professional. <laughs> I walk into school with it. Evidently, those cookies tasted fabulous. And my daughter was a hero. But you see, I juggled priorities. <laughs> Did I balance them? No, I didn't schedule time to bake cookies because I just didn't have the time. Was that the product development for the Pepsi? Uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> Quick serve, ready to make. We didn't to make do that. We didn't make that. Cookies. No, no, that's for parents who <laughs> forget to take cookies to school. <laughs> <laughs> Product line. <laughs> there may be a market for that. Huge, huge market. In what Greenwich, especially. Huge market. All over the country. <laughs> Women all over the country are struggling with this because everything we do today in society is a plot against working women. We don't help them at all. And so we have to find our own survival tactics. And cafeterias are one of them. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's talk about Pepsi for a minute, because um, as, I, as I read earlier, uh, performance with a purpose um, was your mantra, and quite ahead of its time with respect to stakeholder capitalism, et cetera, where you really said we're going to focus on good products and taking care of our own people and making sure that we're, we're good for our environment. Um, talk, about the, talk about the nourishing people uh, as, well as, the, as well as cherishing your people. And what did that mean to you in, in your leadership at Pepsi? I mean, it was performance with purpose. PepsiCo was a performance company, and we were always going to be a performance company. We're not going to back off of that. But what happens is that, you know, somebody asked me the other day, Indra, in your time at PepsiCo, did you maximize shareholder value or did you optimize shareholder value? That is a trick question. Because if I said optimize, they say, oh, shit, you left money on the table, OK? <laughs> Wrong. But let me tell you, if I was maximizing shareholder value, I would not invest in the company. I would outsource every job, offshore everything I can, take all my full-time employees and make them part-time employees, cut their benefits. Is that good for the country? I don't think so. So what happens when you maximize shareholder value? You screw the company, but you make a lot of money. And then the country has to pay for you to bring the jobs back. I find that completely wrong. So what I did was say, hang on a second. We're going to manage PepsiCo for level of returns and duration of returns. We're not going to have this boom splat. Let's generate a level of returns that can be sustained for a long time. So let's anticipate the trends. And instead of passing costs on to society, let's start to address this now. 
So whether it was transforming the product portfolio to have a good blend of sort of fun for you, better for you, good for you products. Look, I was not swinging the pendulum. I was just balancing the portfolio. Uh, I wanted us to make sure we were environmentally conscious. Everywhere I went, I saw plastics on the sides. I saw uh, water use that was excessive. I said, what are we doing? We have plants in water distressed areas. Let's cut back water use. It's very simple to do. Why use two and a half liters of water to make a liter of Pepsi? It makes no sense. Cut back water use, we save money, and we do good for the environment. And people are our biggest asset. Rather than look at them as tools of the trade, let's look at them as real talent. And what if we made them feel like human beings coming to work as opposed to I'm going to cut your pay by 50%. I'm going to cut the number of people by 25,000 because that's the way I'm going to maximize shareholder return. We did pretty good, Ken, on shareholder return. Pretty damn good. But we have a company that's performing well for decades as opposed to boom, splat, boom, splat, which is what people think CEO should be doing. You know, the minute you leave, let the new guy come and crash the financials and then ride the alpha. What a miserable model. <laughs> Somebody has got to call you know, the bluff and say, stop this crap that you're doing on, pardon the French, <laughs> well, you know, this boom splat stuff. It's got to be a balanced level, of, a level and duration of returns. That's the way you should manage companies. Right. And you also made a big push uh, for diversity. You talked about when you started in the corporate uh, development area, um, HR, uh, <laughs> the HR department uh, increased your diversity, uh, but they were protecting the softball team from corporate development, so they gave you more Canadians. That was their... That was the so when I joined diversity. PepsiCo, I, I was the head of strategy, and there were about 50 people in corporate strategy, because that was our input point for talent in the company. So I looked around and said, hey, where's the diversity, international diversity? We're going overseas. And they said, on it, boss. And they came back and said, we've got a really diverse group. And all the people they hired were from Canada. <laughs> and I said, hey, guys, wait a minute. Why did, why did you end up doing this? They said, because the strategy team has always won the softball tournament, and therefore we had to hire for the softball team. <laughs> I said, that's not how it's going to work. You know, we're going to change everything. Uh, let me put it this way. Diversity to me is a state of mind. It's not a number. It's not a program. It's a state of mind. If we're going to serve all customers, all consumers, our employee base should reflect the consumer base. All right? The best example I'll give you is we own the Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima is 80% consumed by black people, yet the entire team working on it were, were white. Not that they can't understand black people, but I think if you put a team with a lot of black people, they will understand Aunt Jemima even more. So I think, you know, when you have a consumer company in particular, if your employee base does not reflect the consumer base, you're making a mistake. But if you call it a program, then people get sort of uh, uh, their backs up and say, God, why are they forcing us to do something we're not interested in? Because it's so much easier to deal with somebody who looks like us, talks like us. Uh, I remember when I joined PepsiCo, my predecessor took me to dinner and said, I hate this diversity crap because if it's another white guy, I can talk to him about sports and we can just give each other a high five and we've solved the problem. And I said, do you know who you're talking to? He said, oh, you're different. <laughs> I'm not different. I am an immigrant, colored immigrant. But that's how people had you know, their perspective on diversity. I think if you change that and say, we want to draw from the entire talent pool. We want to bring the best and brightest. We're going to give them all tailored programs and develop them. All of a sudden, your mindset changes completely. And it's a state of mind. It's not a program. It's not forced on you. You've got to feel it from the inside. And if you feel it from the inside, it makes it so much easier. You don't make those diverse, diverse people feel like they're quota hires, right. which is what happens very often. Right. And do you think people are getting that message now, or we still have work to do? You know, when you start calling diversity woke or whatever woke, because I don't even know what it is, I thought I woke. I woke up. I thought that's what woke was. <laughs> but they tell me something more than that. I don't know what to do about ESG and work because performance with purpose was a form of ESG, but it was linked to performance. When you start to separate ESG from performance and make it a metrics driven, um, you know, 100 metrics driving something that nobody understands, people call it woke and try to dismiss it. We've got to bring it back to its core and find a way to relaunch 
the notion of diversity and ESG in a sensible shareholder value linked way and not say all of these take away from shareholder value, which is the commentary today, which is the big mistake. Because all that we're doing is passing costs from companies to societies and the governments are gonna pay for it. If you have a society where certain groups do not get jobs, that's a cost to government. You know, we companies should be able to bring them in, train them, and help societies. That's our job, that's what we can do well. But we don't, somehow everything has been cast in such negative light. I don't even know how to bend this curve, Ken. Maybe the Bush Library can help. <laughs> Seriously, it's a topic to discuss. Well, we're working on making, making the case for capitalism uh, around the a world. A new kind of capitalism, freedom. yeah. Um, now, you talked about uh, the, the forum, our forum topic is the call of freedom. Mm. And uh, you're, you've been pretty consistent about, uh, about the role of work uh, as the key to freedom, tying the, uh, that, that feeling of dignity and self-worth that comes from, from work and, and not making that inconsistent with social responsibility. Do you think that that is uh, yesterday's news? Globally, do you feel like you led a multinational corporation? You were all over the world. Do you feel like um, the this the benefits of capitalism that have, that are so obvious that have been exported around the world seem to be, be losing momentum? Well, the problem is that all of us are now questioning what is the future of a multinational company? Because if if a company's success and globalization is going to be linked to the foreign policy priorities of the country of domicile, then there's going to be a problem, especially if you're in the US because we are the world's superpower and we will have to exercise our power in different ways. Now, if every country has to bend with every policy change, how does a multinational company stay in business? The best example I'll give you is 15 years ago, if you didn't have a China strategy, you were not worth it at all. I mean, the stock market killed you. Now, if you don't have an exit strategy from China, the stock market is gonna kill you. It took us 10 years to build a meaningful position in China. How do you just turn the tap and say, I'm, I'm leaving China or Russia? Or if you've just struggled to get into a country in Africa and tomorrow the government says you need an OFAC license to continue to you know, function there, how can we function? So I think we have to think through and say, is the role of a private enterprise, you know, if you want capitalism to thrive, and for us to spread our American values and ideals around the world, can it be kind of sort of independent from our foreign policy priorities? I don't know how to make that work, Ken, but that's the only way it's going to work. Otherwise, you'll end up with large companies in every country, okay, um, rather than true American multinationals. I mean, most of the multinationals come from the US, powerful ones we won't be able to maintain those going forward. And that's the thing I worry about. Right. Let's talk about um, something a little bit closer to home. Um, when I read your book, I was, I was um, it struck me that you've been psychically connected to President Bush uh, ever since you walked into the front door at Pepsi. Your building was located in the fourth building, building four on the third floor, which they called it 4-3. <laughs> Um, That's true, absolutely. Right. So, and then President Bush, you, you struck up a relationship um, and he painted you. Mm -hmm. we have, and we have that painting in the foyer. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> I must say, I think that painting was even better than the one in the Smithsonian <laughs> Portrait Gallery. Flattery, oh, flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> it's a great It'll, painting, <laughs> seriously. So he, he has said he doesn't usually paint women because he doesn't want to risk somehow being rude. What do you think of the painting? You know, he mentioned to me that he made me look like a teenager. I agree with him. I look pretty, pretty hot in that picture. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. <laughs> and, and explain your emotion when you heard he was painting you. First, it's like the portrait gallery when somebody told me they were gonna do that. I'm like, why? I mean, it's, it's like, why me? You know, like, are you sure the president wants to paint me? Uh, it's incredulousness, first of all. And then the emotion comes in, and then you shut the door to your office and cry for a little while saying, where did I come from? Where am I? Because I still have that immigrant mentality, and it never goes away. And so you sort of reflect on all this and go, uh, 
I hope I deserve this you know, kind of feeling. And then when I read the write-up, that's when I really boohooed because it's such a beautiful write-up. Um, I don't believe anything has ever been written about me as beautiful and lyrical as what was written in this book out of many ones. So thank you. Really, really beautiful. Really beautiful. Um, so we have just about a minute left. I'd like to finish with a little lightning round, if okay. I can, with you. If democracy were a stock, would you be long or short? Always long. If China were a stock, would you be long or short? Long. No choice. What is your favorite Pepsi product? I consume a tremendous amount of kettle lays, so <laughs> I love that product. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever you drink a Coca-Cola product? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> what teacher had the biggest impact on you? There was a professor at SOM, Yale School of Management, Larry Isaacson, who passed away. And from day one that he met me, he had so much faith in me. I don't know why. I had to earn it every time, but he just believed in me that every recruiter that came on campus, he'd say, have you talked to her? I'm like, Larry, I don't want to interview with this company. I want you to talk to them. So he had faith in me and gave me such a push. I'll never forget him for as long as we live. Great. What book is on your nightstand now? A uh, book that I'm going back and reading because it bother, it's bothering me so much is The Anxious uh, Mind by Jonathan Haidt because I think it's a book that is so profound. If we don't do something about it, shame on all of us leaders. About, about breaking the habits of social media in our youth. Yeah. What are you optimistic about? The New York Yankees. <laughs> Other than the Yankees, <laughs> what is your favorite professional baseball team? <laughs> My favorite professional baseball team. That tough won the one. World Series last year. <laughs> it's a tough one. Hmm. <laughs> this is for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. No, it's just that it's not, I, it's not that I like the Yankees. I love them. I'm, I just adore them. <laughs> That's okay. You don't have to go on and on about <laughs> so, the Yankees. Um, so thank you. I cherish this cap. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And b before, before we dismiss to dinner upstairs, I do, I do want to finish with your call to action. Mm. which was from your speech at the National Portrait Gallery when your painting uh, was unveiled. And you said, I hope that any girl, any person of color, any immigrant, any American who looks at John the artist's creation will not only see a portrait, I hope they will see that anything is possible. And I hope they will find their own way of bringing their spirit and talents to bear on the work of lifting up in this country and our world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking and honoring Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much.